and you don't know which one you are until the night before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. So, so anyway, so this is all a long way to get back to saying that in 2012, I read this article. I'm coming off of my second book being published. I gave a talk here for 100, 100 people here. It was crazy. It was a packed house. Um, I sold my house to write that book. So you know, I needed a year and a half to do it. And some of you that know Trinko Roshi, he handed me this amazing story. And I wrote this book called Heart Blown Open. And I got another book offered basically after that. And I finished that book. And so here I am in 2013. Three books are out. Things are going really well. And I do this Kickstarter campaign, and I make $30,000. And I think, man, I'm on my way out. This is it. The promise is true. Work hard, have the, some talent, and out you go. The dream is, the dream is true. So I worked for two years on not this book. Same title, but not, not this book at all. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in the spring of 2015, I had produced a book. And I sent it out to my test readers and some, some friends and some colleagues. And the feedback comes back, and it's universal. <laughs> Your book sucks. In fact, I wrote here, actually, turd of a book. <laughs> <laughs> So it was an interesting place to be. So I had written, I had created a bunch of characters for the, for the novel that was no good. Um, it was all made up. And so summer of 2015, and uh, I'm out of money. Um, I've made a lot of sacrifices in the previous five years to be on the path that I'm on. And, uh, and I'm broke. Like broke, broke, not like oh, you know, kind of broke, but like well, I don't know if I can get my rent this month, or gas in my car, or eat, you know, broke. And so I have to figure out what I'm going to do. And so I end up getting a job for a tech startup in Denver, and I hadn't had a full-time job in 15 years. <laughs> I'm not really generally full-time material. <laughs> um, and at the time, now we're getting into the fall of 2015, and I'm being um, neglecting my relationship in really terrible ways that I'm in. And uh, I'm neglecting my, myself in really terrible ways, and I'm drinking too much, and I cut myself off from my friends, and I just really start to pull back and, in a way that no one really sees. You know, it's like I just, I vanish in plain sight. Um, <laughs> we have the same Enneagram type and the same personality types. So we, have, we have a short head that it's like, you know, I think of me. It's not good. <laughs> it's never good. It's never good. So, end of 2015, I have no book now. Uh, I get fired from this job because I'm terrible. I mean, I'm good at the job, but I'm just resentful that I'm there. Um, my relationship with this. And so I'm driving one day and I have this horrible realization that the book that I needed to write was the, the book of what I'd actually gone through, which was horrible. Because those of you that know me and almost everybody here knows me, like I, I don't like to be this guy. I don't like to be the one sitting up here. I actually don't usually like to be sitting up there. So I like to be somewhere else. Um, so I thought, oh, fuck. Yeah. Um, so I start writing about a version of what had happened to me. So the book, you kind of parse this. So for the book, what I did was I, I created a character named Logan. And he's similar to me, but I, I stripped him of community. I stripped him of any kind of a meditation practice. I stripped him of friends. Um, I, I isolated him completely, because that was how I sort of felt. And so 
And I took everything that I had experienced over about five years, which was the success and the, and the sort of failures, and I, and I broke those into two streams. And on the one hand for him, I created a past where he was published when he was young, in his 20s in New York City. And he was in this beautiful upward spiral where he was inside of this artist's dream. And he was really identified with hope and with overcoming challenge and with the idea that if he worked hard and he had talent, that he could probably make it and get through. And so that part of my life was, was put into this semi-fictional past. Although I did live in New York City in the 90s, and I was writing. Um, and, then I, and then I took the downward spiral that happened over about six months for me, and I created another arc for him, which was contemporary, where he's writing in the present tense, basically, this is all first person. And over two weeks, his life sort of falls apart in the way that I just described my life in front of And I put those two narratives next to each other so that they could, that it could highlight each other, the hope and then the, the desolation. And so they're going in opposite directions. So it was a very interesting experience. It's very weird to be sitting here, actually. Um, because the book that I ended up writing was a book that was about how you actually you can't have it all. It's a, it's a bullshit promise. Um, you know, my dad was one of nine, and he got out. But eight of them didn't make it out. Three of them died. For every person who's tried to be a successful artist, I have no idea what the statistics are, but I'm sure they're horrific. <laughs> it, I mean, I know quite a few singer songwriters. I, I know, because I, when I was living in Philadelphia, we had a lot of people that came through the bar and worked. And, you know, you just watch them just start at the bottom and end at the bottom. You know, and it never materializes. So part of what I wanted to write about was that story, because I felt like that was sort of the story that really isn't being told, that, that a story that sort of starts and ends in a similar place. Um, and for me, and I've known this for some other artists as well, but, and other people as well, but believing that I was entitled to success made me incredibly self-absorbed and uh, unresponsive to the data that was coming in about what was really going on and where I should really be putting my attention and my relationship at the time. So far be for me to argue with, with the great Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. But he said maybe 50, 60 years ago, follow your bliss. Follow your bliss. And you should. You should follow your bliss. I should follow my bliss. We should all follow our bliss, but we shouldn't expect to be rewarded for doing it. And that was the distinction that I didn't make. So what I'm going to do tonight is read one short section from the beginning, where the book starts off in sort of, in sort of contemporary um, where Logan is in the present tense, and he's talking about, it's the very opening of the book, and he's just talking about what's going on for him. And then I'm going to jump to, to 1996, and I'll tell you when I make the jump. The change will, the, the tense will change from present to past, um, and uh, give you a sense of what I tried to do. And then we'll have questions, and that'll be it. The sun rises rude and intense and disregarding of the headache that presses dully with each heartbeat. I try to hide my face in the pillow, but without the blinds drawn, it's like trying to stay dry under a waterfall. I surrender and go through the routine, coffee, shower, clothes sticking to a wet back. I pause to look at myself in the bathroom mirror. Through the steam, ha through the steam hazing my image, I see a man older than I remembered, bruised under the bruised under eyes dark and veiled with sleep, jaw set in a hard line. The mirror man used to smile sometimes, sometimes growl, sometimes look playfully back, 
but more and more he looks like this man, tired and aging. Before I leave, I go in to kiss her. She's awake. I'm off to work, I say. Hope you have a good day. You too, she replies, throwing off the covers. Can you put the kettle on before you leave? A nod and a trip down the stairs, kettle switched on, followed by the long drive to work, and NPR talking in energetic voices about the emerging news of the day. The office's open plan intended to imply equality with the executives working next to the office managers and junior sales associates. It certainly gives that impression, so long as one doesn't compare pay stubs or the gender of the leadership. It's a tech startup, the kind of company that has transformed my home in the front range of Colorado from a once sleepy mountain town full of hippies and cowboys into a hipster and Tesla-filled, upperly mobile, increasingly crowded region. My position is in marketing, that slippery first cousin of advertising. I'm the content marketing manager, a fancy way to say that I get paid to write stuff that drives customers into the wide end of a marketing funnel. Not unlike the giant fishing nets cast by professional fishermen that catch to catch as many fish as possible, never minding the occasional drought off of the receipt trail. It's supposed to be kind of funny. <laughs> Very serious tone. <laughs> it was funny. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> Former advertising person. Yeah. Also, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I nod at my team, take my seat. <laughs> Open my laptop and stare at it blankly. It's Monday and we have a weekly marketing meeting at 9.30 a.m. I pass 45 minutes in an undercaffeinated crawl of work until we are finally summoned into the large modernist conference room dubbed Rectangle. Clever, as the room is, in fact, a rectangle. <laughs> so that goes on and it just describes how mundane and constrained the office life is. So now we're going to jump back to 1996, New York City, and Logan is writing about, he's dating a young woman named Carissa, and uh, there's quite a bit of dialogue here, and usually professional actors read dialogue because it's actually really hard to read voices, <laughs> have it make sense, but so bear with me. We were in a small bar in Soho that cleared out the dining tables after nine to make a dance floor. Carissa was next to me. Both of us were watching a few, a few people dancing. Her hair had bright pink highlights she put in just a few nights before. She wore a black shirt that, that came in tighter waist and a loose floor-length skirt that showed her pink converse whenever she crossed her legs. So I said to her, I finished the second draft last night. You did? Logan, that's awesome. How is it? Fucked if I knew. She kicked me. Ow! Fuck you don't know, she growled. How is it? I think it's pretty good, I laughed. But don't hold me to that. It could be like the pride of a parent. Based on obligation, not merit. I laughed at how easily she finished my sarcastic observation. Exactly. She might be an ugly little simple-minded child, but she's my child, and I'm proud. <laughs> a lot of the dialogue in New York is extremely sarcastic. <laughs> Good for you, Rocky, she said. And you know what? You did pretty good for an aspiring writer. Too bad, uh, too bad this is just the second round, she continued, her green eyes looking at the ceiling. Fourteen more to go, and then we'll still have to wait for the decision. And at that point, I'll be a middle-aged caterer chasing the dreams of his youth. Oh, I'm sorry, she said. Did I say we? I meant you, since you'll obviously be single then. She smiled. <laughs> Oh, I don't know, I said. I might be the catering manager by then, pulling down something in the low five figures. I think the ladies will be plenty impressed with a middle-aged man clinging to his youth, and I'll dye my hair. What's left of it? <laughs> You're making me hot, baby, with all that talk of failure, middle age, and bald spots. She slinked in next to me. Besides, if you become a famous author, my days of making fun of your insecurities are numbered. Carissa's pink and brown hair and dual pigtails gave her a maliciously youthful look like the evil sidekick of the supervillain. <clears throat> I'm going to get another round, I said. She, she put her hand on my arm. I felt myself blush, which was a strange feeling that someone I knew so well and loved so much and never got embarrassed around. I smiled at her, then went for two shots and two more beers. We downed them as the bar began to fill up, and the music deepened, making it harder to talk. 
So there's a whole scene here, which I'm not going to read. But they start dancing, and he dances for the first time. That's a little autobiographical. It's very awkward. And uh, <laughs> it's huge. And uh, I'm all skipping to something here. OK, so they dance for about an hour. And he says, I got a pee at mouth the hair, heading towards one of the two one-person bathrooms just off the dance floor. I push, I push the door open to a concrete rectangle tangle covered in graffiti and bumper stickers with a single naked bulb hanging down. In the corner of the bathroom, someone had scrawled in a thick pen, if my dreams stood before me as years, I would live forever. So I'm going to skip a little more because there's a lot of making scene, which I'm very uncomfortable reading in front of all these people. <laughs> she comes in, they fool her out in the bathroom, they go back to the apartment, they have sex, she falls asleep. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't good. <laughs> yeah, he thought it was good. <laughs> yeah, <that's dead. laughs> he always does. <laughs> I wish she probably thought different, but okay. So I folded the bed and she fell into it and was asleep before I'd even gotten the sheets up and around her. I kissed her cheek then sat on the edge of the bed and watched her face for a few long moments. Outside, there was the stutter of a siren. A few shouts went out before the unmistakable high-pitched crack of a gun, followed by more shouting and more sirens, and then it all faded to a different block and far enough into the background that it blended in with all the other noises in the city. I opened the fridge and pulled out a beer, crossed the apartment to the security grate, and looked out over the fire escape before fetching an old cigarette from a coat pocket. I grabbed my notebook and pen, pulled a towel off the rack, and stepped onto the metal balcony naked. I spread the towel and sat. The fire escape overlooked the backs of the buildings of 14th and 13th Streets. Normally all the windows, nearly all the windows facing me were dark, except for a few blue, busy curtains illuminated from within by the moving lights in the tower. I leaned back onto the cold brick of the building, lit the cigarette, and took a sip of beer. At 22, I felt both you felt both blah, blah, blah. At 22, I felt both young and old, like time was working against me, even as a nearly infinite amount of it seemed at my disposal. It was a dis it was a disquieting urgency wrapped in a field of spaciousness as vast as the sky, confining and liberating all at once. I took another deep pool of my cigarette, knowing I was standing at the threshold of my own adult life. I had finished a novel before I left my early 20s. Even if it was a complete piece of shit, it mattered. A badly written novel was still a novel, and if it never saw the light of day, it had nevertheless transformed me. I had come to love the, old, the odd corners of the nights, working strange shifts and dead-end jobs while living around outsiders and artists and eccentrics. And harder to admit, I love the ambition, the incredibly slim chance that I could be famous, take my own place in the ranks of influential writers. It seemed an outrageous thought, but I allowed it to run through me, let it inspire and terrify me until, overwhelmed, I finally pushed it aside. I took another deep drag, watching the smoke funnel out of my mouth. There was so much more locked up inside of me. Things the novel hadn't touched, ideas and thoughts and feelings I was still trying to understand. I wanted to put them all on paper, explore all of them as deeply as I was able. My eyes went to the distended bellies of clouds illuminated by the city's lights, looking engorged in need of relief. I lifted my pen and opened the notebook and started to write in drunken, pondering sentences that I would hate in the morning, but which seemed profound and powerful in the first few drops of rain. If my dreams stood before me as years, I would live forever. I thought of that phrase, envious that I had not thought of it, and wondered who might have, someone famous, a frustrated poet, a college student struck by a momentary flash of genius. I leaned my head onto the brick, feeling an unbearable aliveness in me. I shivered again, turned the bottom of the beer bottle up until it was empty. I threw it into the night, smiling as I heard it smash somewhere below. I climbed back in through the open window and into bed. I pulled Carissa close, breathed the smell of her neck, letting my thoughts drift into a future unbound by fear, 
as vast and limitless as dreams. <laughs>
that you know, makes it more image for very much like one because it would be so I've I've never written one, but I can only imagine the first the first bit of person that would be more. So I am very much an introvert. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not comfortable sitting up here. Um, and yes, though, because it's my fourth book, I, I did have experience in getting some hard rejections. So a hard one open, which won awards and did, did pretty well, which was my second book. Uh, I, you know, again, I sold my house to write it, and I had sent that to a really, I had an inside track to a really good literary agency in New York City. And they rejected the manuscript because they said it's a great story, the writing is just not good enough. Which is like, ouch. You know, you got a great story, you just fucked it up. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so that was the first time again the, the feedback that was really devastating. And so I just took another six months and tried to become a better writer. Sure. So yeah. this is your first novel then? It's the first novel published. I wrote the first book I wrote, like Logan, I did write a novel in my twenties. Okay. His gets published, mine never got published. To what extent do you think the, you know, unfolding, cracking, disruptive narrative of women as it's occurred in the last few years, you know, the anecdote with which you began your tale and to which you connected your own artist journey and, and also the, the sort of fracture in this American mythos, to what extent do you think that story, which is so front and center now, ha is sort of freeing things, freeing a kind of Truth telling and confronting the, you know, the the lack of truth of some of these myths. I'm asking you both as a as a man because you know you start with the story of woman and you're a man, and then and also just sort of your your perspective culturally because you, you know, you clearly see things in that lens. It's a good question. I know, I know but you started it with the <laughs> intro. You started it. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, you gave us this like sweeping yeah. sort of perspective before you started reading, so. No, it's a great question. I mean, I sort of, I sort of would be of two lines with it. So one, I think, yeah, it's been great with the Me Too stuff and and uh, and the pushback on this, the structures of culture has been helpful to expose a lot of things that were uh, unconsciously driving a lot of unhealthy things from all over the place. And that's sort of one narrative that I really see, which I think most people sort of see is happening. But the second narrative, which I think Henry Slaughter talked about, and I don't think this is part of the narrative of Me Too at all, but it's like, if women think that men that run companies are happy people, try running a company. Like, if you think being an artist is romantic, try being an artist. The, I think the false narrative is that we as men have something that is inherently valuable, which is the way it looks from the outside. But when you get into the way the world is, it's actually not super pleasant. Like, so I'll be curious to see where it ends up. Like I think what we need is a little bit more of a waking up, everybody waking up to, to a little bit more sanity. Okay. Is that a question? Absolutely, uh, yeah. I mean, I concur from my own experience in, in the corporate world um, yeah. that mirrors you know, part and parcel what you're saying, even though you know, it's technology and multinational corporation, but it's like it's the same, I see the same thing, like almost every. Yeah, it's, it's a pathological humans all over the place, man and women. So um, <clears throat> you kind of talk about the American dream and the, the, the fallacy, you say, Joseph Campbell says, follow your own place, but doesn't mention, don't expect to get compensated for it. Um, right. And to his credit, he, he never said that, so. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm guessing that maybe you answer this in the book, but how would you rewrite sort of the American dream? How would I rewrite the American dream? Yeah, what, how would you describe the American dream or, or the, the, um, the pursuit of bliss and, and that sort of thing? I'm not clear on the question. How would I describe it or how would I criticize it? Well, like, so, so you're saying that, it, that you can't have it all. Correct. So like, what does it look like for you? It, as far as like, what would a healthy version look like? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Got it. Well, I think it's 
You know, like, I think Campbell maybe answered the question on his own. Because he got really irritated when he was old about people asking him about following your bliss. And he got really irritated watching the boomers coming of age and sort of being a bit more narcissistic and self-absorbed than he was appreciating. And so he quipped one time, I should have said, follow your blisters. <laughs> 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 and, uh, I mean, I, I think that's, I think he said it better than I could. You know, it's like, yeah, follow your bliss, but work hard and, and don't. I mean, it's also a lot of my Zen training comes in, right? You know, it's like, we think that the people that have, we think the people in the big houses are happy, right? We think, we think the people in Hollywood are happy. We think, and then you get in there, you get into the world, and it's just humans everywhere. The suffering is, the pain is universal. So, for me, it gets, it gets folded into a much more complex lived reality as I've gotten older and more mature. So that's what I said, you know, Nicholas asked me, and what advice I would give him. The advice is, is right for yourself and enjoy it. And if you, if you enjoy it, and it's fun, and you can make a little money off it, great. You know? But this is what matters, right? The connection with people. So, so what did you do with, with you? You were told that you birthed a turd, right? <laughs> and then afterwards, that you, you, had, you had a great story, but it wasn't written well enough, right? Yeah. So it's one thing just to be told, like, you produce something and someone just says, no. Right. But in, this, in the second instance, you went and rewrote. Yeah. Right? So you had some kind of, there was feedback that was useful. You did something with it. I don't know what you did with the first rejection, but what did you do? <laughs> you flushed it? <laughs> right. <laughs> but then you did something else. Yeah, said, yeah, I mean, yeah, I did. I, I, I looked at my own life. And I mean, I did something I never, I told myself I would never do. I never wanted to write about myself. I just never wanted to do that. I never wanted to be one of those guys. Yeah. The women, you know, like, you know, look at me, look at me. Look at me. Aren't I interesting? Aren't I fascinating? I think I'm fascinating. Um, so that was, that was the sort of pain point, was, was to then abstract it out and, and make it not really about me, make it about a lot of other people that I talked to, as, as universal as I could. And, and person like a lot of these scenes, you know, some of the scenes from the present day, I, I can't read in front of a group because there's no way I can hold my composure. Because mm -hmm. while the while I changed around a lot of the stories, the emotional reality, like this is a hundred percent emotionally autobiographical, you know, and so so it's a super personal book. And that's that's what I just had to do was get get into the scary vulnerable place and, and tell the truth. If I was a better writer, I'd just make shit up. Right. <laughs> but we'll do one more, and then because we have to end. I'm curious about your tactics after the Heart Balloon Open was. You were told you weren't a good enough writer, and yeah. you said you took six months to improve it. I'm yeah. curious about your tactics for that. Your approach. I mean, that, could, that that's sort of complicated too. I I realized. Um, yes, I wrote that book. I'd say maybe it's been two weeks or so after getting that rejection, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I came to this realization that I had really withheld, like I hadn't written as, as good as I could. I hadn't thrown all myself in because I was afraid that there would be, that if I got rejected, it would hurt a lot more. Whereas if I held back. So the, the next round, I just, you know, I did everything I could. I just went through every single sentence and did the, the best job I could with it. And it was like, fuck, you know, if this isn't good enough, it means I'm in the wrong field. I shouldn't have sold my house. That's what this means. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so we're out of time. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, really means a lot. Without you guys here, there's really no point to write it. It's nice to it for yourself. It's also nice when somebody gives a shit. So, um, so from here, I am going to go, and Alyssa is going to go to the kitchen upstairs and uh, have a few cocktails, get a little food. So if you'd like to keep the conversation going, please come and let's, let's chat. <laughs>